Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our little look at a couple of the games that Suda had made previously before Killer7. Uh, we had taken a look at the Silver Case, the HD remake that had been released on the PC, as well as the PS4. And what we're going to be looking at right now is Flower, Sun, and Rain, a game that also had more than one version. Flower, Sun, and Rain was originally a PS2 game, released in 2001, uh, but that version only stayed in Japan. It did not come out to Western territories, did not get a, an English translation, similar to the Silver Case in that way. Um, but then, in 2009, it finally did come out in North America, but not on the PS2, it was on the DS. The game was remade for the Nintendo DS. I don't know why they chose that system for this game, but they did. They added some more content to it. They made use of the dual screens, you know, changed some of some of the way the gameplay worked to make it a bit more user friendly. Not too much because making Flower, Sun and Rain entirely user friendly would go against the philosophy of the game, kind of. Uh, but the DS version is the one that was released in North America. So that's the one that we're going to be looking at right now. And here we enter the hotel, Flower, Sun, and Rain. And the man who's greeting us in the lobby? Uh, well, that's Edo McAllister, who we just met in Killer7. He was in the lobby of the Union Hotel. I don't know what he was doing there. He doesn't work there. He works in the Flower, Sun, and Rain, which is very far away from Philadelphia. So, But we did see a little bit of him in Killer7. We would see a whole lot more of him in this game. This is where he resides. So we're going to start... And, you know, something I'm just going to say right here is that as we play through Killer7, it has not been a surprise that the story has been, you know, kind of vague, kind of obtuse. In comparison to Flower, Sun, and Rain, I would say Killer7 is very easy to understand. If you like the whole thing that Killer7 does where it's really hard to tell what's going on, like this game is that times 10, let's say. Maybe that's maybe it's a bit much, but then again, maybe not. I played through this entire game, and I had no idea what had happened by the end of it. Unlike Killer7, where I had some idea what happened, this game... <laughs> I had no idea. Completely lost. Completely lost by the end of this thing. Still, I am glad that I had played through it. I enjoyed playing through it, even if I really had no idea what had happened by the end. Let's press start. Here's Adam McAllister's Hello! Save Data. That was my first save game. This was my second. I believe that's the one that I completed. It says 75% because there are bonus, uh, I think there are bonus puzzles. I, that uh, Puzzles that were not in the original PS2 version. Optional puzzles, that I did not do all of them. But we are going to start from this, like Edo says, if we want to start from the beginning, select this. So here we go. Let's take a little look at Flower, Sun, and Rain, Murder and Mystery in Paradise. Being introduced to our main character here, Sumi Omondo. He's going to tell us all about him. A searcher. So what does a searcher mean? 
It means he looks for things. Basically, he's a private detective uh, specializing in the finding and recovery of lost items. Sumio is the best at what he does. He also really likes his car. So much so that he named the car. That's probably a nice way of saying it. might notice the distorted voice that Sumio is, is speaking in. All of the voices in the game are like that. I mean, there are distinct distorted voices, but all of them are distorted in this way. Kind of re reminiscent of the distorted voices in Killer7, but then again, I guess they don't have anything to do with each other since the Japanese version of Killer7 did not have the distorted voices. So maybe that's just a coincidence. mysterious man enters a restroom at an airport. But for what reason? What does that have to do with Sumio and our presence on Los Pas Island? You can see the map of the area that we're in on the right screen. Well, it's the bottom screen, but I put it on the right side. You can't see the entire island, so this, like, that map does not exactly help us all that much right now. But that is where we are. As we continue to drive around in Sumio's sweet Toyota Celica, a car that only true connoisseurs can appreciate, you understand. We are seeing a whole lot of him driving. That's like that entire scene was just him driving around. I don't know if it was necessary to really stop the car like that. If you really care about your car, you should come to a slower stop. There's no one here to meet Sumio. Guess we're going to have to go find this agent. All right, control pad or stylus controls. We can walk. Hold on. Found something on the ground. All right, so the lost and found. I think this is what was added to the game for the DS. I'm, I'm not positive about this because I have not played the PS2 version, but I don't think the lost and found puzzles were in the PS2 version. So there are bonus optional puzzles where we can find lost and found items and just return them to the front desk of the hotel. Uh, it doesn't really do anything. It's just like bonus, bonus puzzles if you want to solve the puzzles. And that's the reason we're playing this game, isn't it? We want to solve the puzzles. The way it works, let me just read this. The way it works is that if the hotel staff find a lost item, um, the staff will leave an owner's ticket where they find the item. The actual item will be brought back to the front desk, but where the item was found will be an owner's ticket. So I guess if someone goes back to look for what they lost, they will find the ticket. Now the ticket is placed within a container you can't just bring the container to the front desk, but the container has a numerical passcode that needs to be entered to open it. You need to find the passcode and open it and get the ticket within, and then you can bring the ticket to the front desk and get your item. 
Uh, your ticket will be exchanged for the lost item. Edo McAllister has complete faith in the system. He cannot believe that anyone other than the real owner of the ticket will be able to obtain what was lost. This is wrong because Sumio Mondo will end up getting all of the lost items if you so choose to solve these puzzles. He finds all of them. So the real owners of these items will never get them back. It's a terrible system. Anyway, he publishes these lost and found reports, giving clues as to the numerical codes of the items that have been found. In this chapter, there are three. Truck spare tire. How many tires does a truck have? Stone statue. The twins have recently been given a magnific magnificent birthday, finally reaching adulthood. Combine the two together and... And then miniature gigs. Did you park in the parking lot? Perhaps our parking lot is a bit too large, considering the number of cars using it. What does that say in the lower right-hand corner, do you think? The text is so small that I can't tell. Number of guests, four. If something, two children, three, two years old. I have no idea what that says in the lower right-hand corner. Anyway, we found this thing. Sumio doesn't really know what it is. I mean, we're new here. We don't know what anything is. It really is. It really is pointlessly complicated. But Sumio does feel the urge to find things that have been lost, so... He probably will want to find them. But he doesn't have to. <laughs> exactly. You might even call them collectibles, if you so chose. All right, so we don't we don't actually take the list with us, mind you. This is to give us some extra challenge. You understand? I can look at it again. I cannot take it with me, but I can look at it again. And uh, let's see what we can do here. Um. Oh, here we go. Memo. All right. Uh, let's see. I. Can write memos. I mean, not well, because this is on the 3DS screen. Well, it's a DS game. I'm playing it on a 3DS. Can't write very well, but uh, that's how this works. I can change the screens. And what were the clues? It was something like, um, tires, truck, right? How many tires does a truck have? There was twins? Something like that, and then there was, uh, how many cars, something like that. You know, it would really just be a lot easier if you just wrote this down on paper, but they have a memo system in the game. It would also be a lot easier if they just let you take the list with you, but that would make it too easy, you understand. Okay. How many, uh, cars are here? Like, we got these two. These two cars. Can I look at this one? It doesn't really seem like it. Now I can, I can walk around this exceedingly large parking lot. And something that I think I do have to bring up is sort of the elephant in the room that you might have noticed that this game is shockingly ugly. I, I usually don't care that much about the visuals of a game. Killer7 accepted because it looks so good. This game looks terrible. Um, and, oh, can I walk out into the road? I cannot. And, you know, the PS2 version, it's not really a looker. It does look better than this. Uh, they did downgrade the graphics for the DS version. And I think I, the reason I bring this up is because I think that's something that will put people off from playing it. Like, this game actually does look that bad that I can imagine someone just not wanting to play this because it hurts their eyes. It looks terrible. But it's fun. I liked playing it. I was about to say it's fun. No, this game is not fun. It's interesting. It's not fun. I'm just looking around this parking lot to see if there are any items that come up. I can't interact with that. Hold on. So you see the bottom screen is flashing? That's how I know there's something here. What does this say? I'm getting that DS feeling. Alright, what all that means is that we found a lost item. 
and we're going to open up Catherine, our companion, and also our briefcase, because there are tools inside that we can use to interact with things, is what we do with Catherine. I'm going to select Jack, right? Jack control. Okay, this is lost item number two. Number two was, um, let me take a look. It was twins, right? Something about the number of twins. Um, so what does that mean? I don't know. But we, we first have to decide how we can jack into this lost item. Uh, I can pick these different types of cables. That doesn't work. And I'm controlling this with the stylus, mind you. I just have to keep trying this until I figure out which one of these actually interfaces with the item. And how does someone who doesn't have a, a briefcase like this actually do this to find the lost items? I mean, we have Catherine. I don't know what normal people would do. The answer is two numbers. So, since we're talking about twins, I'm just going to guess at two. Is that, is that correct? No, it was not. It was not correct. I would need to go back and look at that clue again, since clearly it was just not two for twins. So that one's an optional puzzle. We don't have to do it. But we want to do it, don't we? Why wouldn't we want to do that? Now over here, there's a truck. Yeah. Oh, there's actually a bus. So how many cars are parked here? We can look around, like, there's a... Do buses count? Like, there's a bus, and then there are two cars, then there's a third car and a bus, so that's five so far. And then six, and then another bus... No, it's a truck, so that's seven. So I wonder if they would count the buses in the truck. Because I guess there are four cars, but seven vehicles in total. How many wheels does this have? I mean, are, are we counting visible wheels, or are we assuming that the back wheels are doubled up? Because, like, there are th three here. On the other side. There would be six, and there's a guy standing here. But if the back wheel wheels are doubled up, that would give ten. Uh, what are we supposed to assume here? Now, I could talk to that guy, but that actually would make the story go forth. Hold on. I just want to see if I can find the bonus things, like this. We're getting that DS feeling. Okay, let's just go through this. Uh-huh. Endless journey. Pray for text while Hunter hunts. Requiem. Truth. T Catherine. Search culminates right here. He does that every time. He does that every time we have to interact with something. I'm going to assume this is the one with the truck, right? This is number one. So how many, how many tires, how many wheels does the truck have? Oh, you might have noticed that when I got that last answer wrong, it just bumped me out of this whole thing. There we go. The reason is because they don't want it to be too easy, right? So if you get it wrong, they don't just let you put the answer back in, right? They bump you entirely out, so you have to start this whole process again. So I saw six on uh, on that truck. There we go. It was six. We got an item. It doesn't belong to us. Right, actually, we don't have the item yet. We got the ticket that we can use to exchange for the item. The item that, again, does not belong to us. But Edo McAllister is confident that no one could possibly solve this system if they did not actually own the item themselves. So... If we present that ticket to the hotel lobby, he'll just give us the item because the ticket proves that we own it. Oh, and in the up in the the bottom screen to the right, there's a number that keeps going up. That's the number of how many steps we've taken throughout the game. The game will count how many steps we've taken for some reason. And uh, every so often we'll take enough steps that we do get a bonus thing. Every so often. You know, this is not... This is a game that kind of wastes your time and... Hold on. I could look at my own car. My own car has a lost item in it. I'm getting that DS feeling. Here we go. Yeah, you know how people like to talk about games respecting your time? 
This game does not. It specifically does not. All right, it's probably this one again. Number three. So it was um, how many cars are in the parking lot, right? Uh, we have one number. And what did I say? It looked like that if... Oh, I, now I completely forget how many cars were there. Uh, what did I say? There were like four cars, two or th like three buses, one truck, something like that. I'm just going to say four. And if it's wrong, we'll just take a look back at the parking lot and see what it is. And the reason that we'll do that is because it's going to kick me right back out. Yeah. So we have one. Let's just take a look at this specifically again. Now, again, I could just... I just could just accelerate the story. I could just keep going forward. If I wanted to. But, of course, we want to find all of the hidden stuff. All right. So, if we did the truck one. The stone statue one was the twins have recently been given a magnificent birthday, finally reaching adulthood. Combine the two together and... So what age do you think that the twins would have to be in order to enter adulthood? Combine those numbers together. I mean, what what nation standards are we talking about? If we're talking about like the US, I mean, some people consider 18 to be adulthood. Some people consider 21. I don't know. Then miniature gigs. Did I park in the parking lot? How many cars are in the parking lot? You're getting how this game works so far, right? It's like it's completely understandable, isn't it? All right, we have one, two, just remind myself. Now we have this bus, so three. Right, truck is four and five. Right, if I walk back here, can I just see the whole thing? Kind of seem like the viewpoint now. The viewpoint changed for a bit that I was able to see everything. Oh, if I walk, no. Nope. I can't keep the viewpoint right there. Oh, maybe I can. Maybe I can. All right. So, two, let's see. There's a truck, two buses, so three. And then for cars, we have one here, and then one up there, and then two over here. So, I already said four, right? That was the number I put in. So, that's the number of cars, but clearly wants all vehicles. So, one, two, so it should be seven, right? Seven vehicles in the parking lot is, I'm guessing, what's going to happen. Now, keep in mind, this is this is the flower, sun, and rain experience that you're getting here. It's walking around looking for hot spots, and it is getting puzzles wrong and having to try them again. And then, you know, once you get a better idea of what the number might be, and then we put it in, and do we get it right? We do. Yep, got the owner's ticket. Gonna go to that hotel lobby eventually. I can get not right now, but at some point we're gonna go there. Uh, then the last one was the twins. So they had a ma magnificent birthday going into adulthood. How old? Add them together. How old are the twins? So I think it was was a, a double digit number. So we have to figure out when did they enter adulthood? What would be considered entering adulthood? Do you think? And I guess we multiply that by two. You might wonder, why do we have this briefcase that has all these cables that interact with things? Like, what does this even mean? You know, they never really explain that. So I'm going to say maybe it's their 18th birthday. Add it, add it together, it would make 36. Let's see. It is not. Well, you know, that's the only clues we've been given. I could try maybe 21 and then combine it to 42. But then we have to just go do this over again because it would be too convenient to just be able to, an to enter numbers repeatedly. So they do have to kick you out of the puzzle. All right. 
right, so let's try 42. That is also wrong. Well, let's just, I guess let's just talk to this guy. Talk to this guy over here and see what he has to say. Because we're looking for the agent who would be able to take us to the hotel. And this is him here. Well, we had to find the little bonus items. I mean, you probably will be taking plenty of naps when playing Flower, Sun, and Rain. All right, now we're talking. All right, so his eyes glowing, and we have to jack into him. So he's going to tell us about Catherine. We've used it a few times right now, but this is officially the first time in the game we'll, where we will actually use it. Right, Catherine will not figure it out for us. We have to figure out the numbers, and then we can enter the numbers. And so we have a main character who walks around carrying a case everywhere, much like Garcian does. Hmm. Page 13 on the game manual. So what does he mean by that? Well, I guess this is, uh, I don't know if I would call it copy protection. No, it actually isn't really at all. We can take a look at page 13 of the manual right now. There it is. It's an intro, it's a intro for Sumio Mondo. Uh, it talks about that he's a searcher by trade. He's come to Lost Pass Island at the request of Edo. Of Edo. Um, he's a sucker for people in need. He'll embroil himself in any mystery that crosses his path. Now, you can decide Sumio's date of birth yourself. You can choose the birth date at the start of the game, uh, but be sure that you write down the date that you choose. It will become very important at some point in the game. So it's not actually copy protection at all, it's just 
the manual is telling you, you should probably write down what the date of birth is because maybe you're going to need this later in the game. So, four-digit number. Yep, it's all just self-explanatory. Just everything about how this game plays. It's time to get to work, and you know what it means. It's a mystery that's concealed within this man. It's an endless journey. The prey protects their soul, while the hunter hunts the truth. A requiem sung, solely sung for the search. Truth is singular. It's time to go to work, Catherine. The search culminates here, inside this man. Now, we have some different music playing right here. And, I, I mean, it really, it's the same thing that we've been doing. We're going to select Jack. Jack Control. Uh, it, now, it doesn't actually say Jack on that, does it? It says Juck In. So, okay, so we have to Juck In to his eye. We're going to Juck Into His Eyeball. Uh, so, we're yeah. I mean, what's wrong with that? Let's try to just jab his eyeball with these things. We're just going to... There we go. I'm inside. I'm in his eyeball. And uh, right at, what I have to do here is make up a birth date. So I'm just going to say... Uh, I'm just going to say... Zero one. Zero one. We'll say that... We'll say Sumio was born on January the 1st. And anything I entered was going to be correct. That seems like a significant problem. But Sumio feels that it is no problem at all. All right, let's head over to the gate. And if we do, this one over here, yep, yeah, we can now interact with it. Hmm, reversed birthday, it says. Our own birthday is the key. All right, so we entered 0101, so it's a good thing that it was something that we entered was easy to remember. Let's uh, jack into this upside down baby, I guess. Or, or juck in, whichever way you want to call it. All right, so it's upside down, right? Uh, we entered 0101. What would that be upside down? Well, why don't we enter 10? One O. Final answer. And the gates open up. <laughs> Mm -hmm. 
Well, we have to leave our beloved car behind. Also, it occurs to me that maybe we should have used the birth date for the, um, that bonus puzzle with the other baby statue. But we did not get the chance because after opening that gate, it automatically took us into this cutscene. It was all just a test. A really weird, weird test. Sumio has some memory problems. Memory's kind of a big deal in this game. Really, in all of the Kill the Past games. Memories of what happened in the past and what needs to be done to overcome it. Kind of an important thing. Right, pay up a whole five dollars after this is done. And with the truck driving away, well, we can't drive anywhere ourselves. We're just going to walk. Like this. Just everywhere we have to get to, we're going to have to walk. It's a really weird walking, too, because you see, like, I'm kind of, like, pressing up against, like, this boundary right here. The reason is because even though these graphics are polygonal, you don't have analog controls. It's more like uh, you have eight-way controls, and, like, I can't actually walk in a straight line here. I'm gonna have to, like, move. You see, I can't actually walk straight. I'm gonna, like, go up into one of the barriers here. What the game considers to be a straight line is not actually what the path is. It's one of the weird things about Flower, Sun, and Rain that I can't really explain. But we are now approaching the hotel Flower, Sun, and Rain itself, finally. And talk to Edo McAllister, and we can see what it is that he wants from us. Why did he hire Sumio Mondo to come to this island? What does he need him to find? Let's head on in. As we go to the front desk, Edna McAllister is waiting for us. Yeah. 
guidebook of the lost pass is something that we would be referencing many times as we continue playing through the game the information inside is needed to solve a lot of the puzzles i don't think edo understands it all does sound like it couldn't possibly be true but repeating time is one of the things that this game is all about So that is the main point of a good deal of the game. We have to find a bomb that has been placed on an airplane before it goes off. How does Edo know that there's, an air there's a bomb on an airplane? That there's a terrorist? How would anyone know this beforehand? Well, we don't know. But he's totally serious. We need to find this bomb. That's the job. And we are welcomed to Lost Pass Island and to the hotel, Flower, Sun, and Rain. So, that's the premise of this game that you just saw. We play Sumio Mondo, a searcher, a man who finds things. He has a briefcase named Catherine that has weird machinery in it that interacts with things. And we have to enter numerical codes. If we enter the right codes, we can unlock any lock. We've come to this island for the purpose of trying to find a bomb that has been placed on an airplane before it's too late. The way we play the game is we find points, puzzle points, that we can interact with Catherine. And we have to enter a number 
to unlock whatever it is, and then we can find clues elsewhere in the level as to what it is we're supposed to do. We also find clues in that guidebook that we picked up at the front desk. Um, and really, that's it. That's the entire gameplay. We have to figure out what the, what the numbers are that we have to enter to unlock things and solve puzzles. And there are a lot of clues that we will find, such as that guidebook, that will indicate to us what the numbers should be. The game features an eclectic cast of characters, which is what you expect from Suda Games, really. I mean, it would be weird if it didn't. Um, like I mentioned, the game looks incredibly ugly, even for a polygonal DS game, and that's just something you need to get over if you were going to play this game. It doesn't, it doesn't look good. Um, It's a lengthy game, really. I don't remember how long it took me to beat the game the first time. Um, but it is a fairly lengthy game that is broken up into chapters. And in each chapter, there's like a main puzzle that you have to solve. You'll meet new characters. You'll try have to figure out what the relevant information is. What is the number that you need to solve the puzzle? And will you... I was about to say, will you stop the bomb on the airplane in time? Here's a spoiler. No, uh, you actually will not. Not just once, but many, many, many times. I mentioned that um, the game is about repeating time. Well, we're going to see that air. We would see that airplane blow up many times as a variety of things will stop Mondo from reaching the airplane in time. Just so many, so many things will block him from getting to the airplane in time. But every day, with every repeated day, he makes a little bit more progress getting out of his hotel room, down to the bottom of the hotel, out of the hotel, to the outside, trying to make his way across the island to the airport. Every day he makes a little bit more progress until he finally makes it to the airport. And what happens then? Well, like I said, I've, I've beaten this game and I couldn't really tell you what the story ended up being about. This is an incredibly vaguely told story, even compared to Killer7. But I liked it. I liked playing through the whole thing. I had a good time with it. And, uh... I mean, I... If you are liking what you see, hey, go ahead and play it. But keep in mind, it's not really a fun game to play, and it is a game that completely does not respect your time at all. Uh, but it is a game about a really weird story and characters. And if that's something that appeals to you, hey, I, go for it. Go for it and play the game. But I do think that for the vast majority of people, they will probably not want to play Flower, Sun, and Rain. Now, I don't know if there may ever be an HD remake of this. Suda did mention something about it, if the Silver Case did well. Um, so who knows? Maybe we might be seeing Flower, Sun, and Rain HD on the PC and PS4, just like there was with Silver Case. I don't know. If there was, they probably would want to change some things around, maybe to make it a bit more user-friendly. I don't know. Anyway, Ido McAllister will have a little message for us at the end of each chapter. He thanks us for coming such a long way. We should relax, and don't forget to save before going into the next chapter. And that's what it'll let us do as we enter Hello, Save Data. And we could go on to the next day and begin the story proper, but this was only meant to be a short look at Flower, Sun, and Rain for the Nintendo DS, one of the games that Suda worked on before Killer7, one of the games known as uh, being in the series called Kill the Past. Uh, and there are some references, not many, but you'll see there's one reference at least in Flower, Sun, and Rain that was in Killer7, and that's the man that was on screen right now, Edo McAllister. He did speak to Garcian in the lobby of the Union Hotel for whatever reason. It's not his hotel. He works in the Flower, Sun, and Rain, so I don't know what he was doing in the Union. But that's him right there. And that's been our look at Flower, Sun, and Rain for the Nintendo DS. We'll be back next time with something else.